Welcome back to The Daily Show. And it's good to be here. I can't believe more Republicans don't want to come on. It's it must, weird, right? Must be must arch right here. It, it hurts me so much. You know why? Because <laughs> more Republicans came to the show than Democrats before Trump was president. And then Trump won, and then all of a sudden, you guys, you it's think, almost like you were afraid to come back. You think back. there's a cause and effect between the two? Somehow they're related? You think that, wait, <laughs> you guys are, like, afraid of what Trump will think if you come here? Is that what it is? <laughs> I... <laughs> no, regardless, can I tell you? Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming here because I love having conversations. Um, we're going to talk about the book, The Case Against Socialism, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the news of the day. Um... Donald Trump pulling the troops out of the region in Syria. You supported Trump's decision to withdraw the troops. Why? Well, as you and I have talked about before, um, I've been opposed to regime change and war in the Middle East for a long time. I agreed with President Obama's decision to come out of Iraq. I never thought the Iraq war was a good idea to begin with. Um, I think it was one of the reasons he, built, he beat Hillary Clinton. I think it's also been one of the things where there could be some agreement between right and left, but I think people have kind of gotten distracted with the things they don't like about President Trump. But do we really want another war in Syria? There's like five different countries fighting, and are 50 soldiers going to stop the advance of tens of thousands of uh, Turkish troops? But they did, though. They, they did, and they were. Like, let's, let's, let's argue it this way. There were 50-odd American troops in that region, right? right? And the Turkish forces weren't attacking the Kurdish forces. But well, well, literally no, they within were, hours, they, were they getting, have now. No, they were getting ready to, and that's why we moved the 50 troops. But here's my point. So you're saying President Trump did that to protect the troops because uh, that well, was I about to so. happen. I think so, but the thing you is... You think is so, that, you know so. Well, I... No, no, honestly, I'm asking. No, I haven't had a discussion with the president over it, but what I would say is that I think 50 troops are not really what you go to war with. And so if you talk to our generals or you talk to our soldiers, they're sort of of the belief, if America's going to go to war, let's go to war. But you don't go to war with 50 people. But at the but same time, also... the Pentagon has said to that point, the Pentagon has come out and said, no, but this was strategic. We didn't right. want a war. Because it doesn't always have to be uh-huh. war or nothing. It can also be just well, people it, there but it providing be, presence but it, but and support. But 50 people in the middle of a war can be a calamity. You remember what happened in Beirut. We had 300 people in a barracks. We had a mm-hmm. bombing. And it was a calamity. And even Reagan back then said... Well, gosh, now we could go in with an all-out war, or we could right. decide that the Middle East is very messy. I would say that right and left agreed for a long time that regime change didn't really help us in Iraq. It didn't really help us in, in, in Libya. And many of us, look, I've agreed with Bernie Sanders on Iran. We shouldn't be going into Iran without Congress first voting. Mm-hmm. We should have a vote to declare war. But here's my question. Lindsey Graham and the Cheneys are running around the place, and now we have the left agreeing with them. I mean, here's the, where, where is the opposition? They're running around saying, oh, we need to have a resolution next week in Congress supporting that the 50 U.S. troops should stay in Syria. And I think we should have a resolution saying, are we going to declare war? Are we going to be involved in a war? But if so, who are we fighting? Are we going to fight the Turks? Do you know who's allied with the Turks now? The Free Syrian Army. They were our allies for seven years. We trained them. So the Free Syrian Army is allied with the Turks, who are allies, who are supposed to support. So if the Kurds and the Turks get into a fight... By law, we're supposed to actually be supporting Turkey. You've got Iran in the mix. You've got Russia in the mix. You've got Assad in the mix. But really, it all stemmed from the same philosophy that we did in Iraq. In Iraq, we were going to get rid of Hussein, and the democracy was going to break out, and the Middle East was going to be this wonderful place. It's the same with Assad. Maybe it's a faulty sort of notion that regime change is good for the country and or good for the world. I think you get less stability and you get more terrorism every time we try to topple these governments. Right, but... In this case, it feels like what you are saying would be perfectly fine and true were you not dealing with previous actions. And I understand where you're coming from, and you have been fairly consistent in this regard, where you've said, I don't want to go into wars. But America has already placed itself in these positions. The Middle East is what it is, partly because of America's actions. And so are you now saying walk away despite what has happened? Because, Because now... What well, if, like what, I, like what I said, if the Turkish, I, what I, if the, what I supported, the I supported, the I supported across the mm-hmm. aisle President Obama's um, decision to leave yes, Iraq, right. and to lower the troops and say the war is over. Do you think I, it's worth I support it the ISIS, same thing in Afghanistan? If ISIS comes back? Well, see, here's the problem. Everywhere you go, and this is what the neocons and the right wing and the Cheneys and all the crazy warmongers want. They say, if you ever leave, terrorists will come back. But the problem is that argument could go on forever. These same people would still be in Vietnam. They, they would never have left Vietnam. These people never get over, and they never understand that these wars aren't working. You can't spread uh, democracy through military means and at the point of a gun. Mm-hmm. And we can say, well, we could save the Kurds. 
What's complicated, you know, there's four different sets of Kurds. There's Iraqi Kurds, there's Syrian Kurds, there's two political parties in Syria. Some of them have been considered to be terrorists and have had terrorist acts right. on Turkey. There's a Turkish political party that are Kurds. And the thing is, is it's sort of working in Iraq, but I don't think that we're going to be able to, if we wanted to carve out a region of Syria and say, the Kurds, you can have it and we're going to stay with you forever, we'd have to put 10, 20, 30,000 troops in there. Okay, and I'm me, not for me... that. I'm not really for getting involved in the Syrian civil war. I don't know who the good guys are or the bad guys are over there. It's a very, very complicated war. It, it is a complicated war. And like I say, you have been fairly consistent, which makes this, this stance that you're taking strange for me. Because in 2015, you advocated for the arming of the Kurds. You said, you said specifically, you said that you think that they are the most effective and significant fighters that America has and if the Kurds fight to push out ISIS, that Americans should give them a homeland. And really, essentially... Like, I mean, that, we, that would have required creating... A, a, well, no, cutting out land. No, essentially, we have advocated for, and I have supported within Iraq, mm -hmm. a, an area of autonomy. I would prefer it to be their own country. It's one of the few things that Biden actually had a good comment on at the end of the Iraq war. We should have divided it up into three countries. And really, a lot of the problems that come from the Middle East actually stem from right at the end of World War I. What happened is you know, Western powers carved up all these countries regardless of who lived there and what their religions were and who their tribal affiliations were. And so we got stuck with a map like this. But yes, I have advocated in Iraq for a place of autonomy for Kurds, but I haven't advocated or said it would be practical to create one in Syria. And in fact, I think the same problems that we got into with regime change in Iraq, we have the same problems. Hundreds of thousands of people have died in Syria. And maybe we shouldn't have gotten involved in the beginning at all in trying to topple who's, uh, Assad. Maybe it's not the job of America to always decide who runs every country. That's an interesting, that's an interesting standpoint. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this with uh, regards to news that is happening now, aside from Turkey. The impeachment scandal is, is growing every single day. Now, you, 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 you know, you've had your, your point of view and you've said you know, you think the Bidens should be investigated. You think that America should be looking into what Trump, Donald Trump has said is a corruption that is happening somewhere there. So I understand your standpoint, and I'm not ignoring it. That aside, though, do you think that Donald Trump was appropriate in the way he handled that? Do you right. think he did it in the right way? Because if he believed that there was a corruption, why did he not go through the FBI? Or why, why would he put pressure on a foreign leader with the promise of American aid? Was that in my contract? We were going to... I was going to talk... I have to talk about the impeachment? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, no, I'm I, just I don't I'm talk just to many senators. No, I'm just... I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm I just, would have asked Will Smith yesterday, but, I mean, no. you were more appropriate. I mean... No. I would say that there is not anybody from either party that has not tried to manipulate the aid of Ukraine to get what they want. And then there's a broader question you could ask, and you could say, well, should aid, when we give money to a country like Ukraine, should it be contingent on us getting what we want? And then you can say, was well, it appropriate that he actually told him to investigate a particular person that he's running against? Well, was it appropriate for Joe Biden to ask that, say, well, we're not going to give you a billion dollars worth of aid unless a prosecutor quits investigating a company that my son works for and gets $50,000 a month. So you I think say, you could are argue... Are the two cancel each other out? If two uh, people I'm, do a bad thing, does it cancel each other out then? I, I'm saying that most people... It, a lot of us are partisans on either side, uh -huh. but I'm saying most people in America want people to be judged with the same sort of law. So if it looks like we're going to judge Trump with one law and we're going to judge Biden with another law, some people are going to say that's unfair. Some people will retreat into would you their then, corners would, and th say So then would fine. you... Okay, so if you're with those people, then would you support both of them being judged if they've both done something wrong? Well, what I would... No, what I would say is yes. <laughs> I would say that we can judge what they did, whether it was right or wrong, I don't think either one of them are things that we should impeach someone over. So the fact that the president said, well, you know, you ought to invest, uh, investigate Hunter Biden and the 50 grand he was making a month, a month. You know, I, I, there's no specific law, there's no specific thing saying, well, we should impeach people for doing that. There's another thing, you know, you mentioned earlier <laughs> that over half of the public now wants, wants impeachment. But if you ask the public, ask them, you know, are you in favor of actually sending money that we don't have to Ukraine in the first place? I think you'd find 75% of Americans aren't really for sending money to Ukraine anyway, because we actually have to borrow it from China to send it to Ukraine. So I think there's a lot of different viewpoints on this, but I think in the end, what's going to happen with the impeachment thing is people are going to retreat into their camps, and then the people in the middle are going to say and finally make a judgment, 
is it fair to treat people differently? You know, is it fair? Do we dislike other things about mm -hmm. the president enough that we're, we're fine with going on this? I think there is a danger. This is why I'm against most of these special prosecutors, whether they're going after Republicans or Democrats. I think they have too much power to go after, an, uh, after a person's in, entire life that I think really we're going to devolve into where we criminalize elections. And when the Democrats win, they'll go after the Republicans. When the Republicans win, they'll go after the Democrats. And so I, I think there's a real danger to becoming a country where everything's so criminalized. We're going to have an election in a year. Can we not just sort of wait for a year to decide who, who, who gets to run the government? I hear your point. Your book is self-explanatory. The case against socialism. Straight into it, you are clearly against it. The question is, why? Well, I think that if you review the history of the last 100 years and every time we've tried socialism, it seems that time and time again, it ends in authoritarianism, it ends in genocide and famine. When you say we, who are you referring to? When when you look at the cases of socialism over the last hundred years, whether it be Hitler or Stalin or Mao or Pol Pot or Castro or currently in Venezuela, what you see is famine. What you see is a disaster of epic proportions. And I think we have to be careful that we don't somehow think, well, it's going to be different this time. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the questions of the book. And the question is, is violence, is state-sponsored violence an anomaly? Was it just accidental that we got Stalin? Or as some economists and philosophers have said, if you're going to take all of the property from private ownership and the government's going to take it over, there is a point at which people will resist. And that's what happened. You know, when Mao came to take the farms and the farms were collectivized, people resisted and they were killed by the millions. The same happened with Stalin. Hitler was different. He was socialist also. His was sort of was racially motivated as well as confiscatory in nature. But now, today's socialists say, oh, that's not what we mean. That's not what we're for. We're for Scandinavia. So we spend a lot of time in the case against socialism looking at Scandinavia and asking the question, are they socialist? Are they successful? And one of the conclusions we came to is that actually, Bernie's actually too socialist to even get elected in Denmark or anywhere in Scandinavia, in fact. And, and he's American, but yes. Yeah, that's a problem, too. <laughs> that is a problem, too. But when he, when he was bragging about how great socialism was in Denmark, the prime minister of Denmark came forward and said, well, we're not socialists. We're open for business. Don't let Bernie, you know, mislead you. Okay, we're but, not socialists. Right, so then let's talk about that, because it does feel like everybody has a different definition of what they think socialism or capitalism is. It genuinely feels like uh, that. So, for instance, you bring up Venezuela. What's interesting to me about Venezuela is when people have that conversation, they always ignore the fact that Venezuela is plagued by multiple other issues. So people go, look at what happened to Venezuela, socialism. Then I go, does the corruption not count at all? Right. Right? Because as I understand socialism, if the people at the top right. are taking everything, yeah. is that then... Is that then truly socialism, or is it now a corrupt form of socialism, which is more an oligarchy? Is that, is that not what it is? Well, socialism is when the government owns the means of production. They can either own some of them or a lot of them. Mm -hmm. The oil industry is owned by the government down there, but all the prices for all of the goods and services are set as well. So what you have are pr massive and profound shortages. But if you want to see how devastating... It's exacerbated by the corruption, though, once the crisis right. happened with but, the oil but here, price. But here's the question. In a, in a market economy like ours, uh, people become rich because they sell something that people want. In an economy like Venezuela, what happens is you become rich if you control the reins of government. And so as power becomes more and more centralized to a few people, the possibility for corruption is much greater unless the power is diffused. One of the great principles of our country is we have always resisted centralization of power. We didn't like a king, and right. we didn't like a powerful president, but, but and we is... still resist, we but still resist is... the idea and, and we promote the idea of separation of powers and checks and balances. This is interesting because, no, 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 to, no, 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 to this point though, but this is interesting because I, I, I do like what you're saying there about America has resisted that idea. But could one not argue that capitalism has gotten to a point in America where you do in fact have kings and rulers. You do in fact have people who define how other human beings can live because of yeah. how much capital... Because what you just said was people become rich because they sell something other people want. But right. oftentimes we've seen with capitalism, you right. can also become rich because you control a certain resource in a mon monopolistic way where you can then right. force people. So like, let's just talk about, for instance, just the, the medicine industry in America. Right. We've seen. Opioids, they know how to get the people right. addicted to them. They can then right. set the prices. They can then figure out how to keep you within that loop of staying right. with... So now you're in a world where 
you, you don't have a choice anymore. If you're a diabetic, you don't have a choice about the insulin you right. buy. And so that's, that's, that right. seems like it's, 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 a, it's a corrupt system masquerading as just right. pure free markets. When you have honest capitalism, people do get rich based on merit and based on selling something that consumers want. Mm -hmm. Sam Walton, for example. The, uh, the people who uh, have started things that become incredibly popular but there are examples of crony capitalism as well, where the uh, system has been corrupted. But the system's been corrupted by taking people taking and using government to their advantage. So big pharma and the pharmaceutical industry right. has done that. I'm not a big fan of it. I think they've really corrupted the patent system. I think they've abused the patent system. And that needs to be fixed. But that's not real capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's people using government to corrupt the system. I agree. I agree. But time and time again, what you'll find is that the freer people are, the less central power there is in government, the richer they are. And it's amazing when you look at the progress we have. There's a website called humanprogress.org. And if you look at poverty over the last 200 years, it's amazing what we're doing to poverty. In 1820, 90% of the world lived on less than $2 a day. When I was born in the early 1960s, it was down to a third of the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, less than 10%, including all of the poorest countries you can imagine, Less than 10% of the world lives mm -hmm. in extreme poverty. That's because of capitalism and freedom and trade. Let me ask you this then, to that point. In the book, you talk about how young people in America are less in favor of capitalism than ever before, and they support socialism more. Right. Now, you don't seem to acknowledge in the book the why. You, you say like, oh, they don't understand the whys of capitalism. They don't understand right. that they're living better lives, et cetera, et right. cetera. But, but are young people not just witnesses to what capitalism did to their lives and their parents' lives through the crisis? So, for instance, right. when people were trading freely with, you know, credit default swaps, that's capitalism running rampant. That's people going, you can buy a thing that doesn't exist and nobody understands it and you don't have to regulate it, and then all of a sudden, the markets crash, people lose their houses. Isn't that also capitalism? Actually, I think there are many that would argue that that was a form of crony capitalism as well. When the regulations came upon that created that marketplace, there were people like my father who voted against that because he saw that as a crony system that was being created by right. the government. And he actually voted against that. It was called a deregulation bill, where it was a thousand pages long, and he thought it was gonna lead to these things. And so there were people who believed in living in government who did predict these things would happen in the credit default swaps. But when you look at it, when you look at socialism and the history of socialism, and you look at that versus what we've had in this country, I think the, the, the younger generation that's saying in majority numbers now, socialism would be a good idea, I think that um, some of that is a misunderstanding of what socialism is. They're saying, well, the world should be fair, or we should be more equal. Right. But they're not really understanding that socialism, in its definition, is the government owning the means of production. And when they finally come to own it, when they come to take the houses, the farmland, the factories, there has to be violence. Nobody's gonna give it up just sort I, of uh, I voluntarily. Think, I, think that, I think that's an extreme definition of what socialism is, especially if you talk about democratic socialism. And I, and, I, and I say that because I think any extreme can be used as the cherry pick that defines your argument. Right. Because when you look at America, let's just look at Republicans in America. Look at how many people voted for Donald Trump and why did they vote for him? Why did they say they voted for him? They said because they haven't moved in their lives. Their wages are stagnant. They have no money. Right. Factories have moved to countries where it is cheaper to make things. Right. Companies have found ways to pay less tax, pay their workers less, and wages in America have been stagnant but the interesting for, thing, for, for, for but half the a century, but the essentially. But the interesting thing... Is that, but is that not capitalism? Well, That's what I'm saying. Because I understand, yeah, but, like, if we go but, socialism bad, but then is capitalism but, but great But the interesting then? thing is, since President Trump was elected, the median wage has gone up 4,000. Unemployment is at a historic lows. So there's a lot of progress that's happening in a country, but we've become so polarized that people are unwilling to look at that. But things are better. Things are much better. No, unemployment people, no, unemployment people have acknowledged. But in terms of wages in America, wages are stagnant the, the, in America. People me, are not, me, people are not better off versus the previous generation in they America. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. I you mean, do, people, the numbers, no, the no, numbers but more people are amazing. Live, Here, more I'll give people you, live at home than no, ever no, before. No, give, people I'll cannot give, buy their no, own no, houses. Oh, it's just, the, the statistics are overwhelming. I'll give you a couple of them. A hundred years ago, when you, if you were to take a certain amount of money and average workers pay and buy goods, you right. get one basket of goods or one container of goods, you get seven times as much for the same price now. The, the right. amount... The amount that no, 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 this the, is true. I get, the, yes, the, the that's amount, true. The amount of your that's income, true. the amount true. of your yes. income that you paid right. uh, as a percentage of your income for food right. in 1919 yes. was like 
35 percent. Right. It's down to 12 percent. But but then the difference as well is the amount of income that you pay for medical care and essentials now has also gone up an insane right. amount versus that time. Exactly. So exactly. so so then the argument so, you're basically having. No no I'm with but, you. But, but then but, but then but, the argument I'm, the, the one thing but, I'm, I'm having with you and I know we can't talk about it forever because we have the book we want people to read it. But this the, I'm just asking but, you this then. But the Would next you, argument before no, you get no, away from argument. I just want to ask you this. No, I just want to ask you this. Just this. Before you get away from healthcare, yes, healthcare has risen. Healthcare and education are the two things that are rising, and almost everything else has been going down in cost. Uh -huh. But what is the uh, commonality between the two? Government involved them. They're not. They're not great capitalist experiments. They're not great examples of capitalism. Healthcare. Over 50 percent of healthcare is provided by the government now. The prices are largely fixed in conjunction between big government and insurance companies. There's very, very little capitalism in the delivery of health care. So we could say, well, government's so good, we want more government. Or we could say government's not working very well, and we'd like more capitalism in health care. Right. And there are ways to bring prices down in health care. I would let all consumers get together, all individuals who have to buy insurance by themselves, I'd let them join a group, an association like Costco or Sam's Club, and buy their insurance together. And what would happen is through sheer numbers of collective bargaining, we'd drive the prices down. There are ways to fix it, but that's a market me mechanism. Mm -hmm. Or you can say we'll subsidize people because the prices are too high, but when you subsidize them and the prices are going up, guess what? The prices go up even higher, so it doesn't work. That's what we've been doing is giving people money, and the money goes to the insurance company. So since we passed Obamacare, the insurance company profits have gone from $6 billion to $15 billion. They know how to play the system. That is so true. We have do a know racket. how to play the we system. We have a racket. Yes. That is, uh, it is true. And I think what you're saying has a lot of merit in that uh, corruption within capitalism, capitalism slash cronyism doesn't help the system. Um, the book is fascinating. I love having you on the show because we argue and we do oh, no, no, we just, we, we don't, we we just we, go we, back we, and right. forth. But I, I appreciate that you come here. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us on The Thank Daily you. Show again. The Case for Socialism is available now. Senator Rand Paul, everybody.